Exactly one day short of one year after the election of Donald Trump, the fog finally seemed to lift and the skies brightened. On Tuesday, voters rejected Trumpism in New Jersey and in Virginia, where establishment Republican Ed Gillespie embraced Trump's racism and nativism, indicating how deeply the president's poison has penetrated even the precincts of the party that should be vigorously in opposition to it. In Maine, voters approved an expansion of Medicaid that their right-wing governor had rejected several times. In Washington state, Democrats won the upper house of the legislature. Meanwhile, GOP members of Congress are deserting the ship, one by one. As Steve Bannon marshals his outright forces to defeat Maine Republicans, his primary candidates may be so far off the political spectrum next year that they could derail the Republican Senate hopes. Across the board, Democratic prospects in 2018 look promising, if the Democrats don't manage to screw things up, which is a very big if. And yet, before anyone gets too sanguine, consider where we are. There will come a time, no doubt, when professional historians look back on these times and assess what happened to America, and I don't think the assessment will be pretty. They will think of it as a period of national derangement, a time when America lost its bearings. One year ago, Donald Trump, through the vicissitudes of our bizarre electoral system, beat Hillary Clinton, and one year ago, I wrote a valedictory to the America I had known and loved, quoting lines from W. H. Auden's September 1, 1939, in which he described the cataclysm of Hitler's armies marching into Poland and launching World War II. America had flirted with disaster in the past, but we prided ourselves on not having succumbed to it, save with the Civil War. Somehow alleged good sense and solid institutions kept us from going over the precipice. Somehow. And then, last November 8th, we did. I wrote then of the peril the nation faced, of the way Trump's victory broke with the idealism in America's history, traditions and values. There was a feeling in some quarters that those of us who felt that way were being alarmist, that Trump would either normalize himself to fit the contours of our politics, or that he would be normalized by the inhibitions of American democracy, where inertia exerts far more power than movement, especially since the great divide between the conservatives and liberals. You could hope that the disruption Trump represented would be mild, and it would be brief. You could hope that the Americans who supported Trump would come to their senses and that those who opposed him would create a counter-movement. Happily, to some degree, that has indeed happened. Even before Tuesday, recent polls showed a sense of buyer's remorse. Many voters no doubt had felt glee at upending the apple cart of modern America, and they enthused over Trump's promise to destroy America as they had come to know it, which was the America of civility and tolerance and diversity, but also the America of elites and economic inequality and condescension. That promise, however, was predicated on something else that having blown up the country, Trump's demolition would rediscover the old America underneath. Trump was supposed to be a political archaeologist, digging down to another epic. He was supposed to restore America to a halcyon past of white supremacy, on the one hand, and populism, on the other. But Trump has betrayed that promise, even as he continues to give lip service to it. About the only thing he is likely to accomplish is a massive tax redistribution from the middle class to the upper classes, under the guise of tax cuts, which is something any old establishment Republican could have accomplished. In short, as a policymaker, Trump is less than nil, and that probably wouldn't matter much to his supporters, who really don't give a damn about policy, if it weren't for the fact that Trump sold himself as a doer, and he is also nil there. Still, that is just policy. Trump's real accomplishment goes far deeper and is far more destructive than his attempts to repeal Obamacare or revoke environmental protections or banking regulations or any of the other dozens of things he has tried to do and sometimes did. After last November 8, this suddenly became a different country than it had been. Not only had the skeletons come out of the closet, they were leading the parade. No, America was never what it had purported to be. The idealism was always better in theory than in practice. We were always too self-congratulatory, too fixated on American exceptionalism, on ideas like the greatest generation, overlooking a fundamental fissure. That fissure opened because the country was formed over conflicting concepts of freedom and equality. We like to think of ourselves as champions of equality, a tolerant, charitable, compassionate, egalitarian people, showing one another respect and decency, and sometimes we are. 
This is, I believe, the very foundation of American liberalism. But we also like to think of ourselves as free from constraints, independent and self-sufficient, less concerned with compassion than with what we regard as personal justice. This, I believe, is the foundation of American conservatism. Throughout our history, these two forces have continually vied with one another and at best tempered one another. The country operates in a kind of equilibrium between community and individualism, between sacrifice and self-interestedness. Trump has upset that equilibrium. By forswearing equality entirely, he turned us from a community into, as many observers are now saying, a group of tribes, each focused only on its own prerogatives. Trump turned us against one another. He created a new, cold civil war between an expiring America where freedom was paramount and an ascending one where equality was paramount. He arrested history. When he is called the divider-in-chief, the label goes beyond his incendiary rhetoric to a zero-sum blame game. Whatever ails his supporters, he says, is the result of someone having taken something from them. His tweets are aimed squarely against immigrants and minorities who he believes have stolen the country away from the white Americans, white male Americans who write he should control this country. He nurses grievances, he advances conspiracy theories, he exacerbates angers, he scapegoats. He has opened wounds that had taken a century to begin to heal, and globally, he has given the middle finger to the rest of the world while lowering the nation's standing and defending our allies while embracing our biggest enemy. He has stressed might over morality. In short, his is the authoritarian playbook. A recent article in the Boston Globe looking at divisions in York, Pennsylvania, provides a powerful microcosm of how thoroughly Trump has splintered this country in only a year. He may not be the cause of this change, only its product. But no major candidate in any major party ever provided the opportunity he has to loose these divisions and ignite these hatreds. I think of Trump's America as a kind of opposite day, the game we played in grammar school where everything said was interpreted as the opposite. In a remarkably Orwellian fashion, Trump has taken whatever was good in this country and said and did the opposite. Nothing is what it used to be. Everything seems turned inside out. That is the country in which we now live. It is the single most radical political change, I believe, in the country's history. So the idea that Trump is just some bump in the road, or a contagion that will pass, is, I think, a fool's dream. He now owns the Republican Party luck, stock and barrel. Those few who speak out against him, like Jeff Flake, only do so when they know they cannot win a primary against a Trump-backed candidate. Failure emboldens them. The others pretend to ignore him when it comes to legislation, but they know that while Trump is ignorant of and less than engaged with policy, all he wants are victories, regardless of policy, he is the electoral 800-pound gorilla in Republican primaries. Rank-and-file Republicans still love him, not because of any ideological affinities but because of their emotional ones. We cannot and should not ignore that nearly 40% of Americans, basically the entire Republican Party, will walk in lockstep with him wherever he leads. That should terrify us. Moreover, Trump, while no genius, certainly realizes how little he has to do to redeem himself, just enough to keep his hate crusade afloat. We have already seen how the media practically canonized him for shooting some missiles at Syria, or how they gave him kudos for seeming to make a budget deal with Democrats Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi. Trump dread is so deep in most of the country that even his refraining from tweeting for a few days would raise his stock and elicit praise that he was now presidential. Similarly, as I have written here, a war against North Korea would make him a short-term hero in many quarters and would certainly rally much of the country behind him. That is also from the authoritarian playbook. Egomaniacs don't care about other people's lives. I wrote here a year ago that there would be no coming back from this, that no matter what happened subsequently, we had crossed a threshold. Once you know that those old institutions want to inhibit a leader who hired Michael Flynn, a Russian acolyte, as his national security advisor, who threatens the press, who enriches himself in his indirect violation of the emoluments clause of the Constitution, who promotes white supremacism, who insults government professionals, including members of his own cabinet, declaring, I am the only one who matters, or who, well, you know the litany. You also know that the country is damaged, its values are damaged and repair will be a long time coming, if ever. 
Trumpism now owns that dark and malignant strain in American life that has long sabotaged the ideals we prefer to celebrate on the 4th of July, at Thanksgiving, and with stanzas of the national anthem and every salute of the flag. What we have learned this year is that Trumpism is now a permanent part of our polity. White supremacists are not likely to forget that one of their hate mongers took the presidency. This Trump cancer may be only a few aberrant cells, but it is a permanent feature of our body politic, threatening to metastasize, even if he is deposed. We can enjoy Tuesday's triumphs as a rebuff to Trump, which they most certainly were. We can and must remain vigilant to contain the malignancy. Still, we cannot erase the fact that Trump's rampage has left our country deeply wounded, perhaps fatally. He blew up America. A year later, there is no great old America underneath for the Trump-supporting nostalgists. There is instead rubble. And he is not done yet.